Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And just thank you to ODI for hosting this event and making South Sudan the uh, focus of this issue. Um, there's some really interesting articles, and our team are very much looking forward to getting all their copies in country. Um, for those of you who maybe are not familiar with Tier Fund, we are, uh, as Zuri mentioned, uh, one of those multi-mandated agencies. We do both relief and development work in approximately 50 countries. And we um, have roughly about 350 partners that we work with. And at present, we are working in four relief contexts with operational programs. So Afghanistan, South Sudan, uh, Sudan, and the DRC. Uh, in terms of our work in South Sudan, TIF funders worked with partners uh, for approximately about 30 years now, uh, enabling them to deliver relief and development. But in 1998, we went in operationally as TIF fund uh, in response to the famine in northern Baragazal. And so currently, we have about a staff of 250 people. Uh, and we work in two states, in northern Baragazal and in Jongale, and supported from our office in Juba. And our main sectors of work are water and sanitation, nutrition, and delivering non-food items. And we were recently operational in uh, Upper Nile doing health work, but we've just exited from that sector in December. So um, the focus of the article that we put in the Humanitarian Exchange um, magazine was on water and sanitation being our biggest sector. And um, it's probably um, very well known to a lot of you, but just to start with maybe some of the statistics on water and sanitation in South Sudan as the reason for why we put the majority of our emphasis there, um, only 55% of the population uh, have access to improved sources of drinking water. 80% um, of the population don't have access to a toilet facility. Um, the last estimates that we saw was about one third of the existing water points in South Sudan were non-functional. And that less than 50% of basic primary schools and uh, even fewer health facilities have access to safe water and sanitary latrines. So it's already been mentioned that South Sudan is, uh, has a lot of NGOs and in terms of pr delivering basic services such as water and sanitation, um, the figure that I often hear is uh, roughly about 75 uh, to 85% um, of basic services are provided by NGOs. So very much aware that that is the context um, and the water and sanitation needs are still very much present and that's why we're responding to them. But the current debate that Tier Fund became um, very much aware of the last year that's taking place at a higher policy level internationally is that donors and practitioners are very much grappling with the concept of when we deliver basic services, what impact is that having on conflict and stability and on state building? And can we as um, those that deliver services do more to help build peace and to help build up the state? So in Looking at this debate, uh, we became aware that there were a lot of assumptions made um, about the fact that service delivery, people said, oh, it automatically, yes, it does have an impact on beating, building peace and building the state. But there was a lot of assumptions and no, no testing or evaluation to see whether this is actually right on the ground. So in light of that, um, we decided that we would uh, put it to test in uh, two of our programs, South Sudan being one of them. We'd been funded by DFID to do water and sanitation work for the last five years. And so we began the conversation with DFID about doing some research into this. And they funded us for one year uh, with ODI to look into whether, um, to produce evidence, I guess, to contribute to the evidence gap about whether water and sanitation work, which is our area, can make any contribution to peace building and state building. And if so, uh, how do we then include it going forward in our work. So it was a really interesting uh, piece that um, we were very pleased with the results. And um, the article basically goes through some of the findings. And I would just say, um, if anyone is interested in the actual research reports, um, please do come and see me afterwards. And we brought a copy of our policy reports, which are outside if you do want to uh, see some of our um, implications that we've come up with as a result. So um, the research team went to two of our locations. They went to Ye in uh, Central Equatoria, where we work more in a development context through a local partner, very much working with faith-based group with churches uh, to mobilize communities to take, um, to deal with issues that arise themselves using their own resources. And they also visited our work in Northern Baragazal in a wheel, uh, where we do a lot more hardware construction in water and sanitation. And the lens that they went through was that the desk review had been done in a literature review, which had come up with five 
potential entry points for where our service delivery might be able to have an impact on water and uh, um, on peace and state building. And they were um, opportunity, so looking at whether our work could bring more economic opportunities, visibility of um, us as NGOs, collective action, and whether we encouraged that uh, inclusion and uh, what kind of groups were involved in our work and accountability. And so um, I'll just touch on maybe a few of the pertinent findings that came and then encourage if you'd like to know more to just refer you to the research. I think the evidence came back actually challenging the assumption that delivery of WASH per se does contribute to building peace and, st and uh, state building. The drivers of conflict in South Sudan are very complex and they're not easily shaped by one intervention by one NGO. And um, there are other services that might have higher perceived uh, state building and peace building dividends. But the thing that also came back to us was that often the way that we as an NGO were delivering WASH wasn't maybe appropriately tailored to the dynamics that we were working in in terms of peace building and state building. And what mattered most was how we were implementing and therefore, if we implemented in certain fashions going forward, we could therefore play maybe a contribution, I emphasize the word contribution, to local peace and state building dynamics. And that was very, very interesting. The caveats obviously came back that there's a need for more research. This was a very limited study, only in two of our locations. The need to contextualize because every single different place is different. And we found so many different variations and also to be very realistic about what we can achieve, but also not to ignore this debate as there are some very interesting findings coming out of it about maybe the contribution that we can play. So the three that came out particularly in relation to South Sudan were um, inclusion and collective action and visibility. And so those are three that Tier Fund is very much grappling with in its South Sudan program going forward. Uh, inclusion is particularly looking around the scope that maybe our programs going forward can more uh, involve perceptions of, of um, people being who feel marginalised and who feel they have unequal access to our the basic services that we deliver. And it came up with quite a lot of um, practical suggestions about how we could potentially going forward um, understand different groups, involve maybe uh, beneficiaries more in our site selection and a host of different uh, interesting findings there. And then collective action and collaboration. The research uh, particularly honed in on the work that we did with our partner in Central Equatoria, saying, uh, praising this core strength of using faith-based groups to collectively bring communities together to recognize their own resources and to work then on water and sanitation. And um, the church being a very important convener in South Sudan, sometimes when the state historically hasn't had such a strong presence and to strengthen structures, bring groups together, and then together they address different needs, one of which is water and sanitation. And then finally, the other uh, big challenge was visibility. The fact that INGOs are seen often by communities as the main service provider. And I think this was a real big challenge to Tierfund because in our project in the wheel, for example, we had gone to quite a lot of lengths to work with the government, to engage them, to get their uh, permission to operate and to work alongside them, but still they were not perceived as being involved. The credit went to Tier Fund. So how you work with that challenge of visibility of who is visible when you deliver and the risks of what that will do in terms of state building. And then a lot of practical suggestions came forward of which we now need to grapple with about how, uh, who is visible and what risk that can play. So, I mean, I think just to quickly wrap up, I mean, there were so many useful um, insights that came up for Tier Fund programmatically, mainly to um, realize our own policy commitments in terms of better conflict analysis, being more conflict sensitive, but also um, in terms of looking at whether we can have a shift in our mindset in working in South Sudan to maybe take into account better the impact that our service delivery and WASH could have and looking at some of these entry points and looking for a more flexible way of working but knowing that we need to also have these conversations with donors because um, unless we have the space to be able to think some of these through in terms of our time frames that we operate under, the funding that we're given, we can't often bring some of these things to the fore. And so we have the policy report that we've done looks at more of those implications. And so just to conclude, I think the title of this was are we at a crossroad? And I think for us as Tier Fund, we would say yes, because there's a very conducive policy environment at the moment where donors are challenging NGOs to consider what is our impact when we do service delivery in contexts like South Sudan and how um, 
should we change anything? It, should we at all? And what's our impact, especially if we've been there for a number of years doing the same projects? Um, is that the best way to go about things? So I think um, we found that we had a lot of uh, useful things to take away, but we hope maybe some of the findings will resonate with other NGOs, with other sectors as well. And that's why we hope this is just the start of the debate. So. Thank you very much, Sarah. No, thanks for uh, sharing with us the learning from the experience of TIA Fund. It'd be interesting to hear during the discussion you know, the extent to which it resonates with, uh, um, with other you know, um, NGOs that are operating in a similar space, uh, you know, perhaps also in other sectors. Um, but I'd now like to invite Sandrine Tiller. Sandrine is the Program Advisor of Humanitarian Issues for Médecins Sans Frontières here in the UK. And in this role, she provides um, advice on analysis and advocacy for MSF. But she's previously worked with uh, the British Red Cross and the uh, ICRC with postings in Jerusalem and in Beirut. Sandrine, thank you very much for being with us. 